Joining me now from the Russell Rotunda is Senator Jack Reed of Rhode Island, a ranking senior Democratic member of the Armed Services Committee. Uh, I'm pleased to have him back on this program. Senator, thank you. Thank you, Al. Let me start off by asking if the president provided a clarity of policy and purpose with his address Monday night. I think he did. I think what he did is indicate clearly how he built uh, very adroitly a diplomatic coalition involving the Arab League and the United Nations, and that he limited our involvement uh, because the nature of the threat, a humanitarian crisis, required action, but it certainly didn't require the full-scale and exclusive involvement of the United States. So I think he was very successful in uh, defining the, the challenge, which is to prevent a humanitarian crisis of the first order, and also uh, indicating that the pressure being applied to Gaddafi will hopefully eventually lead to his departure. Uh, so I think he set out the terms very well. Senator, is success in Libya defined, however, by whether Gaddafi goes or not? Well, I think uh, increasingly it is defined by his departure. He, he's illegitimate in the eyes of his own people. I thought one of the most important aspects of this whole diplomatic process was the condemnation by the Arab League. It's the first time I can recall they ever uh, singled out a sitting Arab leader, uh, calling him a criminal, uh, or asking for a no-fly zone. That was a, uh, an extraordinary uh, moment. And so his, uh, his status is such that uh, I think ultimately he has to leave. That means the, the family has to leave also. And so we have to, and Secretary of State Clinton, who's done a superb job, uh, was overseas today building that political diplomatic coalition to provide transition and to provide support to an emerging, hopefully, democratic government in Libya. Well, in, in, in part, that, of course, in large part, that's going to depend on, on what takes place on the ground there. What, what is your sense of where the military situation is in Libya right now? Well, the most decisive military factor today is the air power that the uh, NATO forces are principally British and French air forces are providing. Uh, it will effectively degrade any Libyan Gaddafi forces, and it will give the, the rebels the opportunity to uh, organize themselves, uh, you know, retake more territory, put increasing pressure on Gaddafi. At some point, uh, if Gaddafi, particularly if he leaves in a, in a, a sudden departure, uh, the NATO forces uh, could consider some type of stabilization force on the ground, not including American forces, and, and that might be the final transition state. We've done uh, things like that in the past. I can recall visiting East Timor where there was uh, international forces to provide stability, uh, and it was very effective. But that should only be done if Gaddafi leaves? Well, at the, not so much physically leaving, but I sense he's becoming increasingly more marginal. I think you're going to start seeing fissures appear in his own ruling uh, circle, uh, where people sense that his days are numbered, they're looking for the best deal, uh, they might put pressure on him, and he might become so isolated, so marginalized in a small section of the country that effectively he's no longer a factor in, in Libyan politics. And at that point, particularly if his armed forces, which are generally mercenaries, desert him, uh, then I think you have a situation where uh, NATO forces or some other forces in a stabilization mode could come in. If, if he does go, uh, that's obviously uh, welcome news for the United States. Do you have any sense, however, what a new Libyan regime would look like? This guy has ruled the place with, you know, with dictatorial authority for 42 years. There are very few other institutions or anything else to build on. Well, you're exactly right. He has systematically undercut any type of uh, civic organization, any type of political organization. The only uh, institution that appears to have any coherence is the state oil company, but that's not the kind of institution you build a democratic society upon. So I think this would be our real challenge, but I think it's a challenge uh, that is within the, the capacity of the international community. What do you think our policy should be if he should decide to leave? Should we just let him go somewhere to some other African nation, or should our policy be to treat him like Milosevic and uh, try to try him as a war criminal? Well, our policy should be to treat him a as the, the war criminal. He's been branded even by his uh, fellow Muslim leaders in the Arab League. Uh, there is a, a possibility that he could go, though, to a, 
a country that would give him safe haven and prevent his extradition. Uh, but I don't think we should, at this juncture, uh, forego any possibility of bringing him before the International Tribunal in The Hague. Uh, that, in fact, is, is, is a strong incentive for him perhaps to seek some type of exile where he feels he might be protected by the local government. But we should not surrender the, 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 the high ground, which is that this, his activities have been criminal in nature and have to be uh, accounted for before the world. Uh, justice. With this situation and the speech Monday night, is there a, an emerging Obama doctrine on intervention? Well, I think it, uh, it might not be a doctrine. I think it represents a very pragmatic view of our interests tied to uh, support of our ideals, the, the notion that we can't allow these humanitarian disasters to take place if we have the capacity to, to effectively intervene, uh, that we want to encourage uh, grassroots democratic uh, expression and growth as we've seen uh, tr uh, this transformative effect in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Tunisia. We want to encourage that. But we want to recognize it's best done uh, through a coalition. It's best done by using the particularly unique capabilities of the United States, uh, but not uh, committing our forces to long-term engagements. Uh, so I think those are the some of the aspects of what's emerging as the president's approach to foreign policy. I think it makes quite a bit of sense, uh, and I think it draws on our strengths while also drawing on the strengths of our allies. You mentioned other countries in the region. Uh, what is your read now on the situation in Bahrain and Yemen? Well, there I think we've been able to have effective conversations with uh, in Bahrain the king and in Yemen with President Salah, made the case that they cannot uh, conduct violent attacks against their own people, uh, that they have to begin to plan for a transition to a more democratic rule, and that uh, that's a slow process. Uh, but it's a different situation uh, from Libya, where Gaddafi basically was attacking his own people. In fact, uh, prior to, to his attack or his proposed attack on Benghazi, uh, threatened to go door to door to hunt down people and destroy them. I think we've been able on a diplomatic level to start the process of transition, particularly in Bahrain, and also to encourage in Yemen that President Salah to begin to consider his options and a transition to a, a more legitimate and a more popularly accepted government. And how about Syria, with which we've had rather unfriendly relations? Syria is another example of this incredible transformation, and I think if you asked me six months ago that there would be widespread uh, uh, political movements for, from the streets, from, from the grassroots, I, I, I wouldn't have been as positive in my response. But what we're seeing in Syria is a phenomenon throughout the Middle East. People are beginning to assert themselves. They're not satisfied with the corruption. They're not satisfied with the poor economic, economic opportunities. They see a ruling elite that is uh, preventing them from uh, a better life. Uh, that is breaking through now. It might be through the new technology of social networking, but that is taking hold. And it's remarkable that in Syria, we're seeing, one, that type of popular movement. And two, I think the Assad regime feels constrained because of the popular international opinion and support for these groups. They're not, you know, they've taken some violent uh, steps, but they're very, very short of some of the repressive measures they've used in the past. So uh, it's remarkable there. That might be more remarkable. And from a, a geopolitical standpoint, it sends, uh, I, I think, very, very uh, strong signals to Iran that their sense of sort of regional growing uh, influence might be waning if there's a change in government in Syria. Senator Jack Reed, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Al.